Greetings, Mother Factors. My name is Sam, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about the dystopian yet morbidly tempting world of consequence-free sex and murder that is Westworld. Sounds like my kind of theme park. Well, that and Chessington World of Adventures, that is. I'm also joined by Alex, the queen of all-time movies, to give her wisdom upon this most west of all worlds. Hello, I'm very excited to be here, doing four times the number of facts that we do on all-time movies. And one. But how much does it cost to visit Westworld? How did one actor on the show figure out a plot twist through his eyebrows? And is anyone else as lost with the plot as I am? Okay, I see, so Westworld is a maze, but in that case, where's the port key? Oh no, that's Harry Potter, isn't it? Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so put on your Stetson, pull up your leather chaps, with arse or without, and prepare yourself for 101 facts about Westworld. By the way, be warned, these violent delights have violent, um, spoilers. Number one. Westworld is an American sci-fi western thriller dark dystopian drama TV show extravaganza created by Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy for HBO, which incidentally stands for Home Box Office. You learn something new every day. Ha, <laughs> well, I should, I run a fact-based YouTube channel. Okay, I'm getting off track. Moving on. Number two. Westworld is based on a film of the same name that was released in 1973. The film was written and directed by American novelist Michael Crichton, who was incidentally voted one of People magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People in 1992. The more you know. Number 3. Michael Crichton was inspired to write the original film following a trip to Disneyland. While at the resort, he rode the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. They should make a film out of that ride. Just one, though. You don't need five or something, that'd be stupid. Anyway, he was instantly impressed by the animatronic characters. This then somehow translated into evil androids in the Wild Wild West. The mind of an artist is an inscrutable thing. Number 4. Wild Wild West. The stories of all the Westworld productions revolve around a state-of-the-art Wild West themed fantasy amusement park populated by androids. The park caters to high-paying guests who pay generously for the chance to indulge in whatever depraved behaviour they like, without fear of consequences or retaliation. Number 5. The original Westworld movie had a budget of around $1.3 million, which is the equivalent to a little over $7.5 million today. Not only that, but MGM only gave Crichton 30 days to film the entire thing. Number 6. Yul Brynner plays the main antagonist in the film, an android known as the Gunslinger. Interestingly, Brynner's costume in the original Westworld film was actually the exact same costume he wore for his role in the 1960 classic western The Magnificent Seven. Why it's not one lot? Number 7. In the original Westworld film, Yul Brynner dresses all in black as the cyborg gunslinger, and Richard Benjamin plays the human guest with possibly the world's most boring name, Peter Martin. In the Westworld TV show, though, this has been reversed, with Ed Harris dressing entirely in black as the human gunslinger, and James Marsden appearing as a cyborg. Number 8. A number of minor injuries occurred during the filming of the original Westworld. Brynner was struck in the eye by a piece of wadding from a blank cartridge during the filming of a shootout scene, which scratched his cornea and left him unable to wear his light reflecting contact lenses without the eye watering and turning red. The injury was so significant that shooting had to be postponed to allow Brynner's eye to fully heal. Ouch. Number 9. Not only that, James Brolin suffered minor injuries while filming the scene in which his character is bitten by a rattlesnake, despite wearing protective padding on his arm. Number 10. Some of the scenes in the film that depict an amusement park were shot in the gardens of an estate belonging to Harold Lloyd, a silent film star known as one of the most popular and influential film comedians of the era. You know that iconic shot of a guy hanging off a clock? Yep, that's Harold Lloyd. Number 11. The film also made use of one of the same sets from the classic 1974 comedy western Blazing Saddles. Thrifty. Number 12. Towards the end of the movie, the gunslinger has acid thrown in his face because he's an evil robot who totally deserves it. Spoiler alert, by the way. In order to create the effect of his face bubbling and fizzing, Brynner's face was coated with an oil-based makeup mixed with ground Alka-Seltzer. The acid that he had thrown in his face was actually water, which reacted with the concoction, causing his evil face to froth. Number 13. The original Westworld movie was the first feature film ever to include digitally processed sequences which depicted the gunslinger's robotic vision. Every 10 seconds of footage from the gunslinger's pixelated point of view was the result of eight hours worth of computer processing. Number 14. Apparently, Westworld is also the first movie to discuss the existence of computer viruses after the breakdown of the robots begins to spread, prompting comparisons to human illnesses. Number 15. 
Arnold Schwarzenegger studied Yul Brynner's performance in the original Westworld film to prepare to play his iconic title role in the 1984 sci-fi classic, The Terminator. Number 16. Not only that, renowned sci-fi and horror filmmaker John Carpenter based the indestructible quality of the mass-murdering weirdo Michael Myers from the seminal classic 1978 horror film Halloween on Yul Brynner's Gunslinger. Number 17. The hat that Brenner wears in the film was reportedly custom made for the role, and even has his name handwritten in it. In 2016, this same hat was sold for $27,500, along with the original box and labels. Number 18. Incidentally, the original Westworld wasn't Michael Crichton's only story about an amusement park that goes horribly, horribly wrong, as he would later write the 1990 novel Jurassic Park, which was quickly turned into the classic film of the same name only three years later in 1993. Not only that, the Jurassic Park film adaptation featured actor and director Richard Attenborough as the inventor of the ill-fated Dino Park, whereas in the Westworld TV series, the park's inventor is played by Sir Anthony Hopkins, who appeared in no less than five films directed by Attenborough. Small World. Number 19. The original Westworld film spawned Future World, a sequel with which Michael Crichton was not involved. There was also a short-lived TV series based on the two films called Beyond Westworld, which aired in 1980. <laughs> Westworld on TV? That'll never work. Number 20. The first season of the recent Westworld TV series premiered on the 2nd of October 2016, and concluded on the 4th of December 2016, consisting of 10 episodes which actually for American TV seasons is fairly short. But actually it's fairly long for us British, but then everything's bigger in America, isn't it? Number 21. Warner Brothers has been trying to remake the original Westworld film since the mid-90s. Between 1996 and 2013, big names like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Quentin Tarantino and several others have been linked to a possible reboot of the original film. It wasn't until some guy called J.J. Abrams pitched the reboot as a TV series to Nolan and Joy that Westworld finally came together. J.J. Abrams, by the way, is the exec producer on the show. That's why I mentioned him. Number 22, oh, oh, oh delicate. In case you didn't know and recognised the name and thought, oh, I wonder, it's true. Jonathan Nolan is the youngest brother of Big Shot director Christopher Nolan, famous for his work on the films like The Dark Knight, Inception, and Dunkirk. Jonathan, who writes, directs, and produces Westworld, has worked alongside his brother on some of Christopher's biggest projects, sharing screenwriting credits on The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, and the 2014 space epic Interstellar. Number 23. Nolan has described the show as being the next chapter of the human story in which we stop being protagonists, which is cheery. Wow, he must be fun at parties, huh? Number 24. During Westworld's pre-production stage, Nolan took inspiration from video games like Bioshock Infinite, Red Dead Redemption, and Skyrim, all of which he stated he played as a genuine form of research. <laughs> okay, Nolan. All of these games force players to make choices based on morality and honour, choices that often affect gameplay later on. Number 25. As such, the Wild Wild West world takes many cues from modern video game gameplay, especially open world games. Concepts like non-playable characters, side quests, incremental difficulty increases, equipment upgrades and easter eggs are all often found within the world of Westworld. Number 26. Nolan has also been very open about the debt that Westworld owes to Game of Thrones. The high fantasy drama series featured uncompromising depictions of sex and violence, all that good stuff, that many people regarded as shocking, making it possible to create a show with a stark depiction of similarly sordid and disturbing themes. Additionally, the film-like quality of Game of Thrones proved that making cinematic TV was viable, and that everyone should be doing it. They should, they should, they should. EastEnders, step up the game. Number 27. Another big influence on the show was the 1999 sci-fi classic The Matrix, which influenced the show's main concept of questioning reality. <laughs> yep, mission accomplished there, job done, box ticked. Number 28. Nolan and Joy took a great deal of inspiration from the 1982 classic sci-fi epic Blade Runner as well. God, it's like a sci-fi orgy of inspiration. The film encouraged them to make the series much darker and cerebral than the original film. Number 29. Nolan named the town of Sweetwater after the farm in the 1968 spaghetti western epic Once Upon a Time in the West, which is his favourite western apparently. Number 30. The name of the company that runs Westworld is Delos, which happens to also be the name of a Greek island with an interesting mythological history, which I'm going to tell you about right now. Delos is said to be the birthplace of the god Apollo and the goddess Artemis, making the island sacred, leading to a law making it illegal to give birth or die there. Number 31. 
In order to keep everything top secret, the actors on Westworld were only given the script to study bit by bit. That way, the actors knew a lot less about what was going to happen, reducing the likelihood that they would open their big actor mouths and reveal spoilers. Number 32. At one point, producers for Westworld had considered Clint Eastwood for the role of the man in black. They then presumably remembered that Clint Eastwood would probably be too busy speaking to chairs, and regretfully rescinded that particular plan. Number 33. The English actor Jared Harris also auditioned for the role of Robert Ford, but was clearly rejected in favour for someone slightly more Welsh. Number 34. Other actors considered for the role of Dr. Robert Ford before Anthony Hopkins got his handsome Welsh hands on it include Max von Sydow and Christopher Plummer. Number 35. Funnily enough, one of the main reasons why Anthony Hopkins agreed to take the role of Dr. Ford was because he was originally going to be contracted for one year, and was told from the beginning that his character would not survive the first season. Whoops, I should have said spoiler alert before, but I, I said it in the intro, so can't do me for it. Number 36. The appearance of Hopkins in the show is particularly momentous because it's the first time that Hopkins has ever appeared in more than two episodes of television in 25 years. Ever since he appeared in the 1991 television miniseries adaptation of the classic Charles Dickens story, Great Expectations. I don't know why I said it. Number 37. Interestingly, the name Robert Ford is shared by the man who shot infamous American outlaw, Jesse James. Though Jesse James is often depicted as a Robin Hood figure who took from the rich to give to the poor, there is no actual evidence to this effect. There is evidence, however, that James was a pro-Confederate slave owner. So I guess, good on you, Robert Ford. Number 38. American actor Owen Bailey was originally cast as Logan, but was forced to withdraw due to scheduling conflicts. Bailey is known for his role as Private David Kenyon Webster in the miniseries Band of Brothers, as well as his appearance in the movies such as Fight Club. Number 39. Australian actress Miranda Otto, oh god, actually I just remember the last one did an Australian accent, that did not end well in the comment section, played a character named Virginia Pittman in the show's unaired pilot. But producers ultimately reconceived the role and Otto left the show. Pittman was instead replaced by Teresa Cullen, who is played by Danish actress Sidsy Ballett Knudsen. Number 40. The character of Ashley Stubbs is played by none other than Luke Hemsworth, the oldest and least famous of the Hemsworth brothers. Number 41. Ben Barnes, who plays Logan on the show, broke his foot running down a flight of stairs just before the first day of shooting. Bummer. Convinced that he would lose the job if he told anyone, he used the limp as part of his portrayal of the character, forcing him to maintain that limp throughout filming. Maybe he's just method. The meaning of life. The skeletal robot seen playing the piano during the show's opening credits was modelled directly on composer Ramin Jawadi's own hands. Animators used footage of Jawadi playing the piano and converted them into ghostly white limbs dinking the keys on a pianoforte. Do, 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 do. Number 43. Additionally, the galloping horse scene moving in the show's opening titles is a reference to the horse in motion by Edward Mybridge, an English photographer who pioneered moving images. Number 44. Likewise, the man seen in the opening sequence with his arms outstretched in a circle is a reference to the Vivitruvian Man, a drawing made by Italian polymath Leonardo da Vinci around 1490. Number 45. The title sequence for Westworld was created by a design firm called Elastic, the same team that designed and produced the acclaimed opening title sequence for Game of Thrones. Number 46. Westworld and Game of Thrones also share the same composer, Ramin Jawadi. Jawadi is responsible for creating the title music for both shows, but has also worked on even larger productions like Iron Man, Pacific Rim, and Batman Begins. Number 47. Filming for the very first episode took place in and around Los Angeles, California, as well as in Mobe, Utah in August of 2014 over a period of only 22 days. Number 48. In a bit of TV trickery, would you believe that the scenes shot on the train aren't actually filmed with a real train going along tracks? <laughs> I know, perish the thought. The train's exterior is set on a flatbed truck which is driven up and down the State Route 128 in Utah, with the actors riding along with it. Number 49. The Mariposa Saloon is one of the sets at the Melody Ranch Motion Picture Studio in New Hall, Southern California, which has been used in a number of well-known productions, such as The Lone Ranger, The Magnificent Seven, and Deadwood. The Melody Ranch replica frontier town was once owned by American singer-songwriter Gene Autry, a notable singing cowboy, whose career spanned several decades in the mid-20th century. Number 50. Some scenes in Westworld are filmed at Paramount Ranch, a location used by Paramount Pictures since all the way back in 1923, almost 100 years ago. 
Far more modern productions that are filmed at Paramount Ranch include CSI Crime Scene Investigation, Weeds, and The X-Files. Number 51. Another filming location utilized during the production of the show was the Southern Californian town of Agua Dulce. If your Spanish is up to scratch, you may notice that Agua Dulce literally means sweet water. Well, technically it means water sweet, but hey, that's romance languages for you. Also, in case your memory's bad, remember, the town is called sweet water in the show. Number 52. The name of the brothel in Westworld, first seen in the premiere episode, is called Mariposa Saloon, which is thought to be an oblique reference to prostitutes. The Spanish word Mariposa means butterfly, but it's also a slang term for prostitutes, which uh, I uh, hear, owing to the behavior of butterflies, which move from one flower to another like the s they are. Number 53. Jonathan Nolan came up with the idea of having the piano at the Mariposa Saloon play modern songs, in order to remind people that the world is indeed a theme park in the future, not the past. The songs are also chosen by Nolan and include hits like Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden, A Forest by The Cure, and Back to Black by Amy Winehouse. Number 54. Additionally, not one, not two, not three, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, not nine, not ten, or anything beyond ten, but four instrumental covers of Radiohead songs are featured throughout the show. These are, no surprises, motion picture soundtrack, fake plastic trees, and exit music for a film. Number 55. The appearance of the player piano throughout the series is in fact a reference to Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s first novel, Player Piano, which depicts a dystopia of automation in which almost every single aspect of human life is mechanized. The novel is in many ways a warning against the ever more ubiquitous presence of technology in our daily lives. Number 56. That repetitive three-chord phrase that can be frequently heard in the show's background music is lifted directly from the original Westworld film, in which it underscored the gunslinger's slow but steady pursuit of Peter Martin. Number 57. Arnold's son's favourite tune, which is played throughout the series, is called Reverie, a solo piano piece written by the French composer Claude Debussy in 1880. There you go, don't have to get Shazam out now, you're welcome. Number 58. When Dr Ford is talking about earlier versions of the hosts in the first episode entitled The Original, he states that they repeated themselves, broke down constantly, and a simple handshake could give them away. This is a direct reference to the original movie, in which it is established that the robots could always be identified by their handshakes, because the manufacturers could never get those damn hands right. Number 59. While you're talking about it, Alex, also in this episode, Peter Abernathy finds a photograph of a smiling woman who is later revealed to be Juliet, William's fiance and eventual wife. In reality, the photograph is actually just a stock photo of a woman standing in Times Square in New York, and is not an image of an actress taken specifically for the series. Number 60. At one point in the second episode, entitled Chestnut, Dolores turns to Maeve and says, These violent delights have violent ends. This slightly menacing line is actually a quote from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and is a warning from Friar Lawrence to Romeo that wild, passionate romance can end badly and with little warning. Number 61. At another point in the same episode, Logan appears in his black western clothes and zips up his fly to hide his precious secretive genitals. The problem here isn't the genitals, they're probably fine. The problem is that the trousers have a zipper. Trousers from that era were fastened up with buttons, not zippers. In fact, if you're wondering, zippers didn't make it onto men's trousers until the late 1930s, well after the 1870s in which the frontier environment of Westworld is meant to be set. Did you not think would notice your lies, Westworld, huh? Number 62. One thing that viewers of the show really want to know is how much a ticket to Westworld will set you back. The answer is mentioned both on the Westworld website and by Logan in episode 3 of the show. A single day in Westworld cost $40,000, or a little over £28,000. Would you pay that for a trip to Westworld? What would you get up to once you- Actually, don't tell me that bit. Just answer the first question up in the poll up above. Number 63. In episode 3, entitled The Stray, Bernard, or Bernard as you Americans call him, hands Dolores a copy of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and she reads a passage aloud. Her physical appearance and clothing mirror traditional representations of Alice, hinting at her history. Nolan and Joy have stated that Alice is one of the principal inspirations for her look and persona. Nintendo 64. Another hashtag inspo for Dolores is not a literary or cinematic character, but a painting by American artist Andrew Wyeth called Christina's World. The painting shows a young woman lying on the ground in an arid field, looking towards a grey house in the distance with one arm positioned out in front of her, suggesting uneasy and unidentified yearning. Number 65. Furthermore, the name Dolores is derived from a particular Spanish title of the Virgin Mary, Nuestra Señora de los Dolores, meaning Our Lady of Sorrows. Yet the name Dolores literally means sorrows or pains in Spanish. Delightful. Number 66. There's a specific reference to Bioshock in Episode 3, when the head of the insane thespian Sander Cohen can be seen on a pedestal in Dr Ford's office, sans his distinctive moustache. 
Nolan has praised Bioshock in the past as the most literate and thoughtful pieces of entertainment he has seen in years. So no wonder he wanted an Easter egg to it. Number 67. Dr. Ford's office also features a section of wall covered in several ghostly looking faces. Many viewers consider this a reference to another critically acclaimed HBO series, a little one you might have heard of, Game of Thrones, in which the faceless men of the House of Black and White keep a large hall full of the skinned faces of dead people. Well, obviously they're dead. They don't have faces. Number 68. When Felix is tinkering with the birds programming in episode 5 entitled Contrapasso, he says, Come on, little one. This is a reference to Jurassic Park, in which John Hammond says the exact same line when encouraging a Velociraptor to hatch. Number 69. Violent delights. Incidentally, this episode is the only one in the series so far for which the British Board of Film Classification gave an 18 rating. Every other episode has been in 15. Number 70. In the sixth episode, entitled The Adversary, when Bernard is searching the abandoned offices, the gunslinger from the original 1973 Westworld film can be seen very, very briefly in the shadows. Number 71. Not only that, the background music and noise that can be heard when you see the original gunslinger is taken directly from the very same original Westworld film. Number 72. After the filming of the sixth episode, production on Westworld shut down for two entire months. Why I hear you ask? Well, I'll tell you. This was done in order to give the creative team more time to prepare for the final episodes of season one. They should have known how they were going to end it already, really, much like this sentence, because I don't know where this is going. Haha, <laughs> chestnuts. Number 73. The eighth episode of Westworld is entitled Trace Decay, a reference to the psychological theory that memories leave some kind of physical or chemical trace within the brain that decays over time. Number 74. At one point in this episode, Dr. Ford says one man's life or death were but a small price to pay. This is a direct quote from Mary Shelley's 1818 horror novel Frankenstein, which tells the story of an extraordinary pair of genes that fit four best friends perfectly despite them all being different sizes. Oh wait, no, that's the sisterhood of the travelling pants. I always get those two confused, they're so similar. Number 75. Also in this episode, the area where Dolores and William find the framework of the church steeple has a unique and very famous rock formation behind it. The Trekkies among you will instantly recognise this as the same rock formation within which Kirk fought the Gorn in Star Trek in 1967. The formation is known as the Vasquez Rocks, and is situated fairly close to near Los Angeles in California. Number 76. At one point in episode 9, entitled The Well-Tempered Clavier, Logan can be seen wearing a distinctive pin on the lapel of his jacket that bears a striking visual similarity to the hand of the king brooch from Game of Thrones. Number 77. The tenth and final episode of Westworld, entitled The Bicameral Mind, has a running time of 1 hour and 30 minutes, which is obviously far longer than your average TV episode. In fact, the episode is even longer than the original Westworld film, which clocks in at two minutes shorter at one hour, 28 minutes. It's not about the length, it's what you do with it. Number 78. In this episode, when Maeve boards the train to leave the park, an overhead announcement states that the train will be leaving in 15 minutes. At this very precise moment, there are only 15 minutes left in the episode and the whole season. Oh, clever. Number 79. At one point in this episode, when Dolores is talking to the man in black, she describes a time when giants had roamed the land, but are now just bones and amber. This is yet another affectionate nod to Crichton's Jurassic Park, in which dinosaurs are cloned from blood found in ancient mosquitoes that have been trapped in amber. The mineral, not a woman called amber. Number 80. In the below-ground storage area for decommissioned androids, there is a globe statue that's identical to the one seen in the arrival area in the Westworld sequel Future World, suggesting that older areas of the original Westworld park may have been abandoned. Number 81. The two body shop technicians, Felix and Sylvester, are named after the two cartoon cats of the same names. Also like in the cartoons, Felix is the nice one and Sylvester is the nasty one. Number 82. The surname of the villain Hector Eschaton is taken from the Greek word eschaton, meaning last or final. Eschatology is the field of theology that concerns finality, i.e. death, judgement and the afterlife, etc, etc. And in the Bible, the term refers to the end of the world and the end of the current evil era. Ergo, Hector's surname hints at the apocalypse. Number 83. Tandy Newton has stated that although she appreciates the craftsmanship that goes into creating the corset she wears on the show, she absolutely hated wearing them, stating that she, and I'm quoting her exactly here, couldn't wait to get out of that f***ing corset. Not only that, Newton also claimed to be more comfortable wearing nothing at all, saying that the cast and crew were all really respectful and in awe of her bravery, and that she found her nude scenes liberating. Number 84. The Man in Black's unusual handgun is a Lamatt 1861, a rare revolver that features a 9-shot 42 caliber cylinder, as well as an additional single-shot 20-gauge shotgun barrel. 
The real Lamat was infamously unreliable, but in Westworld it's likely to have been perfected to deadly effect. Number 85. The reason why the Man in Black's Lamat 1861 is modified is likely because the original weapon was ordinarily a cap and ball gun, meaning it used loose powder and spherical bullets. But in the show, it's been customized to work with cartridges. Number 86. The figure inside the maze pattern seen in the pigs and clover puzzles throughout the season had both arms stretched out, but in the final puzzle, one arm is touching the head. Surely it's pointing to its brain because after all, the maze equals consciousness. Number 87. The name Bernard Lowe is an anagram for Arnold Weber, revealing Lowe's true identity and nature. Number 88. During an actor's roundtable held by The Hollywood Reporter in July of 2017, Jeffrey Wright revealed that he was only informed of the big twist in Lowe's storyline on the morning he was due to shoot the scene. That is up to the minute, he did not have time to prep for that. And according to my Am Dram classes, that's very, very important. Number 89. Okay, I said it before, but now I really mean it. This is a huge spoiler for season one, and this is the point of no return, okay? So ready, steady, let's cook. Jimmy Simpson, who plays William in the show, managed to figure out his character's true identity fairly early on in the series, when the makeup department began changing the look of his eyebrows. Based on that clue alone, Simpson managed to figure out they were trying to make him look like Ed Harris, the man in black. Number 90. One clue regarding the existence of different time frames is the Westworld logo itself. Eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed that in the present day timeline, the W features straight lines like that of the actual Westworld TV logo. However, in William and Logan's timeline, the Westworld W is styled differently, more retro some might say, indicating an earlier time period. 91. The first season of Westworld was a huge critical and commercial success, averaging around 11.7 million viewers per episode across multiple platforms. According to HBO, which I may remind you brought you The Sopranos and Game of Thrones, this is the most ever for a first season of a drama. Number 92. If you needed any more indication of Westworld's quality and popularity, the show received the most Emmy nominations of any drama series ever, at a very impressive 22 nominations, four of which the show won. Number 93. The Hollywood Reporter has claimed that budget for the first season of Westworld was approximately $100 million, an extraordinarily large sum for the first season of a TV show. Not only that, but a quarter of that figure was spent solely on producing the pilot episode, meaning, if I put my maths cap on, that roughly $25 million was spent on a single episode of television. Number 94. Evan Rachel Wood and Lewis Hertham both previously appeared in the dark fantasy horror television series True Blood, though they never appeared on screen together. Wood played the vampire queen of Louisiana, Sophie Ann Leclerc, and Hertham portrayed JD, the leader of the Shreveport Werewolves. Number 95. Ed Harris also starred in the 1998 satirical science fiction film The Truman Show. That film also dealt with the weighty philosophical implications of fake reality, wherein everything about the life of the eponymous Truman Burbank is scripted and televised for entertainment. Number 96. This isn't Anthony Hopkins and Tandy Newton's first time together either, as they both appeared in Mission Impossible 2 all the way back at the turn of the millennium in the year 2000. This song had gone multi-platinum, everybody bought our set. Oh no, that's another year. Number 97. Similarly, Tandy Newton and Tessa Thompson appeared together in the 2010 drama film for Coloured Girls. It's, that's the title of the film, it's not, I wasn't saying, it's just, oh god. Number 98. Westworld marks the third time that Sir Anthony Hopkins and Ed Harris have appeared together in the same production. Having both appeared in the 1995 biographical political drama film Nixon and the 2003 drama The Human Stain, which was about my life. Haha, <laughs> just kidding though. Yeah, not really. Number 99. In November 2016, HBO renewed Westworld for another 10 episode second season, set to premiere on April the 22nd, 2018. Prepare yourselves for an even more violent, robotic, non linear timeline craziness, people. I am ready. I've been waiting over a year. I am ready. Number 100. James Marden has stated that the writers and creators of the show plan to continue the Westworld story for at least five seasons. And if Jennifer Lawrence doesn't appear in at least one episode of those upcoming seasons, I shall be writing a very, very curt letter. Number 101! For the second season of Westworld, Nolan has stated that new worlds are to be introduced for the show. The most likely upcoming world is Samurai World, as we've seen it already. Whereas, Nolan has confirmed that other worlds that featured in the original film, such as Roman World, will not be included. I'm just waiting for one on Facts World so people can share the pain of my torturous existence. <sighs> Please help me understand it. 
Anyway, that was 101 Facts About Westworld. I do hope you enjoyed that. What would you like to see a world of? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, let me know what you want to see me do next on 101 Facts, because how do I know otherwise? In the meantime, which is a phrase no one's ever said before, check out one of these two videos on screen now. You're sure to really enjoy at least one of them. No money back guarantee. Goodbye.